Good morning. Pleasure to, to see you uh, here this morning. And we are uh, going to discuss a very important uh, uh, topic today, the, uh, how to deal with the offshore economy. And for that uh, purpose, we have an excellent uh, speaker here today and an excellent uh, panel. So first, uh, uh, Alan Riley, who is a, a, pro a professor of law and um, a senior a fellow also at the Atlantic uh, Council uh, at the energy <coughs> uh, 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 section here. He will uh, uh, present his report dealing with the offshore economy that is uh, available in a number, limited number in uh, print and also on our website. So the question today is, uh, what is the offshore? Why is it important? What uh, should be done about it? and uh, why and what is uh, realistic. And for that, uh, we have uh, an excellent panel afterwards with uh, Professor Louise Shelley from George Mason University and Dr. Clay Fuller from American Enterprise Institute. So without further ado, Alan, please, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Well. <clears throat> well. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and it's nice to be at the Atlantic Council once again in Washington on a, on a sunny but perhaps slightly chilly morning. Um, what I'm going to try to talk to do to today about is the offshore, what it is, and how we deal with it. And in the course of this, perhaps explain uh, the problem. Now, when I start with this, when we talk about the offshore, we think of a number of things. We think, of course, of sandy beaches in the Cayman Islands. And we think about um, offshore, from a Western perspective, largely in a lot of the discourse in uh, the media and in an academic debate, political debate, it's all about um, tax avoidance, some tax evasion. Largely in these modern times, it's about tax avoidance, classically um, the use of um, the o offshore uh, companies um, and offshore tax regimes to uh, reduce the level of uh, tax payments by major uh, European and American companies. Classically, for example, Google using uh, intellectual property payments uh, from its uh, European uh, subsidiaries to uh, companies it owns in the, in, in the Bahamas in order to reduce the level of its tax payments in those countries. And there are a whole series of questions about the erosion of the tax base as a result. <coughs> My argument is that whilst that is a serious issue, and there's also a serious issue with, with those uh, centres being used for tax avoidance, the far greater problem, and actually it may be a problem where the actual amount of money of itself is less than the, the, the actual uh, tax avoidance evasion issues and the effect on the erosion of the tax base. Whilst the amounts of money might be slightly less, might be significantly less, um, the actual effect is far worse. And I would argue that there are three essential points here which makes, makes this an issue of serious concern. The first is that if we are talking about, when I talk about fl the flood of tainted money from developing countries and ex-Soviet countries, this is a much more greater harm than what we normally talk about, which is the, as I say, is the tax avoidance evasion issues in the West. And this is for three reasons. First of all, it undermines developing countries. You're talking about the effect of the loss of revenue for human development in those countries, the, da the danger that the, the, if you like, the plunder mode, as I call it in the report, uh, becomes permanent, and these developing countries are never going to get out of their s status uh, of uh, underdevelopment, the situation of underdevelopment, because of the capacity of elites to plunder those countries and move that uh, cash abroad. The second harm is that it corrupts the West in the sense that in order to bring that cash into the West, plant it in the West, protect it in the West, they need an army of complicit uh, bankers, business professionals, 
um, and politicians to support it. And because we're talking very significant sums, there is plenty of cash to swill around into our own political system. And the third problem is this, is the impact on uh, the uh, foreign relations of these states. If you are a, a elite in a developing country in plunder mode, you need to deflect your population from noticing, or at least noticing too much, the amount of plunder that you are indeed plundering. And one way to do that is to use uh, the West, turn the West into an enemy. So what we have created is this um, offshore machine, which is undermining democracy around the rest of the world, corrupting our own institutions, and creating more enemies for ourselves. This, I argue, is not a good thing, and we should do something about it. So my first question is really is what is the offshore? As I said at the beginning, you know, the, the mental image of the offshore is sandy beaches and palm trees in the, in the British Virgin Islands or the Cayman Islands. But of course, the offshore is not just physical offshore. It is Delaware, where, which probably is, I think I used the phrase in the, uh, in the report, as the world champion of anonymous shell companies. And essentially, you know, they generate more shell anonymous companies every year than probably all of the offshore um, states and offshore jurisdictions combined. But also it's London and New York. It's the banks, the hedge funds, the private equity funds which are used, the professional advisors based in those cities. Uh, which are part of the offshore. And I think it's worth understanding that the, the offshore is in many ways fundamentally a Western invention. And I'll come back to why that is in a moment, historically. And the other point to recognise is that the mental image when you have an anonymous company, say from the British Vir Virgin Islands, is that the assets of that anonymous company are in BVI. Most of them are not, and the reason for that is very simple, is that if you have got um, billions and billions of dollars of assets uh, illegally plundered from your home jurisdiction, you cannot simply stick it in a bank account in the British Virgin Islands. You need somewhere which, where they've got a very large economy, strong rule of law, uh, uh, where you can effectively hide it. And those places happen to be in the United States and the European Union. And in terms of the principal cities where you go for, you go for high-value added real estate in London and New York. So although the assets may be um, held by anonymous companies, say in BVI, the actual assets themselves are often real estate in major Western capitals, principally London and New York, and, and or in financial instruments and stock, all held in the West. So the assets are here. And that, I would argue, as I go on to argue, provides us with a substantial degree of leverage to deal with this issue. Now, the point about this being originally a Western creation is clear if one goes back to the history of this. The modern offshore stems really from the 1930s and, in fact, in many ways was not wholly um, a negative development. I mean, uh, one of the major stimuluses, uh, stimuli of the development of the offshore in the 30s was the various fascist and Nazi regimes in, in, in Europe and people understandably seeking to move their assets out of the reach of these uh, terrible um, regimes. You also had, probably in the 40s, um, American business executives and later the mythical Belgian den dentists and European entrepreneurs making money and wanting to, uh, often quite legitimately, uh, in terms of tax avoidance, reduce their overall tax liability. So it begins off as a Western concept, and that continues in terms of the industrialization of the offshore in the 1960s, as you get with restrictions on the movement of dollars in the United States, out of the United States, you get the development of the euro bond and euro, uh, the, the, the euro dollar markets, uh, 
and the offshore becomes a significant way for U.S. companies to uh, obtain finance and foreign credit, which they couldn't obtain uh, in the United States for a lot of their foreign business operations. So it then becomes industrialized as a, as, as a business development then. And then you, and I suppose the, the modern trend from that development is the, the sort of Google situation where you use your intellectual property rights in low tax offshore jurisdictions to reduce your overall tax liability. There's a kind of historic connect, continuum with that. The problem with all of that was that was you know, a Western system developed largely for Western purposes. What has happened, uh, since particular since the uh, fall of the Soviet Union, probably a little before that with the, the development of the, um, <clears throat> with the oil crisis in 1973, but turbocharged by the uh, fall of the Soviet Union, what we see is a significant um, uh, flows of, of, uh, of capital from uh, developing countries into the offshore and then on into the, into the West via anonymous companies, clean, laundered, and now in every major uh, um, high-value thoroughfare in the West. That's what we're looking at. Now, it's very difficult, and I give a whole series of different uh, analyses of how much of those assets are uh, tur turning up in the West are actually tainted and where they come from. And we look like ex-USSR, Africa and certain parts of Asia where you've got a significant plundering effect. And there are different analyses you can give on that. And I think at one point in the report, I, I, uh, there's a very long footnote explaining all the different bases on which you can, um, you can analyse this. Um, but to give you one of the... Um, Professor Henry at Columbia uses perhaps one of the lowest figures, which is about $12 trillion uh, of, of, of flows, of tainted flows from developing countries. That's one figure you can use. Well, another way to look at it is to sp go specifically down into a single country and, and try and extrapolate that way. And the, if you do that, and I do this in the report, if you look at um, Karen Dewisha's book, uh, Klepto Putin's Kleptocracy, she estimates that uh, uh, bribes in Russia uh, every year amount to about $300 billion. Now, if you have something like that's been continuing for um, more than a decade, and, and uh, President Putin has been in power for two decades, then the order of magnitude, not all of that, of course, will be exported, but a substantial proportion of it would be, and that alone would put you over a trillion dollars of tainted flows into the West. And the difficulty with all of this is where, where is, is you look, when you look at the consequences for those countries. I says you have this, first of all, the general point is that the level of harm that you're inflicting on developing countries is really very significant, being the lost tax revenue, uh, uh, the lost ability to uh, provide health care and education, uh, to build infrastructure and enhance economic growth. That is lost. And the other problem, which is perhaps more fundamental, is that it creates, amongst those elites, huge incentives to never reform, because the state is like a, a, a chicken that can be perpetually plucked, um, plucked, plucked, and plucked again. The, uh, and the elites can therefore go into a, a plunder mode forever and a day. And the difficulty is this. When you have that plunder mode situation, there is no need to worry about your own assets. And this is what I call in the paper the rule of law paradox, that the elites can rely on the rule of law, the independent courts, the protection of property rights in the West as the lever by which they can remain in permanent plunder mode in their own states. And if you compare that to the situation uh, in uh, Europe and the United States, because there was no offshore in the 17th, 18th and 19th centuries for our own elites to go to, they ultimately had to do a deal uh, in, uh, with, with, with the rest of the population. Um, anyway, 
pay some taxes at least and accept uh, a, 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 a common governance of the state. There is no need for developing countries at least to do that deal and we are creating the situation which is permitting that. The other problem is the scale of flows in. Even at a very limited level, even if we take the minimum levels we're, we're talking about here of a few trillion dollars, a few trillion dollars, the flows are still so huge. I mean, it's, it's in comparison to the potential tax avoidance evasion issues to do with uh, uh, Western corporates, and the numbers may are there, there seem to be larger. But the point is, what we're talking about here is corrupt flows and the capacity of those flows to corrupt our institutions directly and indirectly. And that is where I think you have a, a serious second problem. And if you look at the banks, and particularly, I think one of the things I find most alarming about the Dansk, uh, the recent scandal with Danske Bank, is the is this simple st that both the scale of it, and then the reactions. Essentially, it was so much money, and they were making so much money themselves uh, that everybody looked the other way. And the issue is, how do you create structures which are robust enough to stop that? And then the other problem with all of this is the deflection strategy of the plundering elites. And I think that works in a number of different ways. First of all, the fact that we are so weak uh, and accepting their plunder into the West, and that our institutions are so flexible, in itself creates a degree of contempt amongst the, uh, the plundering elites of developing countries. But also, they realize it's a great potential deflection strategy that they can operate to protect their capacity to continue to plunder. And that is about turning the West into an enemy. The very fact that um, the, these elites control, will usually control the media in their countries, they are able to rev up attacks against uh, the West, demonize the West, provides an, a, a convenient enemy which allows the elites to continue to plunder and then send their ill-gotten gains to Mayfair or, or uh, the Champs-Élysées. And, uh, and, and, and so we actually are creating our own enemy here through supporting uh, the, these uh, elites through our systems. So then briefly, because I don't want to go on too long, and uh, Anders is going to stop me in a moment, I am... Um, I want to talk about briefly about what we can do. I raised uh, three real points. One is that I think my fundamental point is the way to get moving on this is EU-US cooperation. If there is a substantial amount of US and European cooperation, the two major Western jurisdictions can effectively uh, close a lot of this down and then bring in the rest of the OECD and essentially wall off, wall off the OECD from these corrupt flows. And, and there is a, some technical issues with the European Union because it can't very easily use criminal law powers, but we can use, I think, a set effective civil law powers. And the two issues that I focus upon, and again, I would wholly accept there is a whole long list of things one can do, but I tried to focus on two which I thought felt were rather big bazooka options. One is to essentially prohibit the use of anonymous companies in the EU and the US. And that would mean that no transactions will be possible with anonymous companies. They would simply be prohibited under the law in both states, in both the US and EU. And also, anonymous, all existing anonymous companies would have their assets frozen in the West. In the e, well, so starting within the US and the EU. And they would have to then prove that those assets uh, who was the ultimate beneficial owner, and the source of funds for the acquisition of those assets. And if they were not to do so, ultimately they would be seized. I also suggest a much stronger whistleblowing law in uh, both the US and the EU to reinforce the incentives for banks and other financial institutions and professions to blow the whistle on the sort of behavior we saw at Danske Bank. And then finally, I argue one of the big problems with this will be we'll end up uh, in our hands enormous amounts of cash uh, 
because a lot of their assets will end up being seized. What I argue is a series of national funds should be set up, which can actually be used for the good of those countries, if not immediately, at some point in the future. On the principle, I think, of the Iraqi Compensation Commission set up after the invasion of Kuwait by Iraq in 1991. So at that point, I will stop, and uh, I will hand over to the panel. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alan. And uh, uh, let us take uh, the seats. So uh, our panel, please, that's your uh, seat, is uh, Louise uh, Shelley, who is uh, the owner and Nancy Hurst endowed uh, uh, professor uh, in the Shah School of Policy and Government. Uh, at George Mason University. She's also the founder and director of the Terrorism and the Transnational Crime and Corruption uh, Center at George Mason. And uh, she has uh, written uh, several books uh, on related uh, topics, most recently Dark Commerce, uh, How a New Illicit Economy is Threatening Our Future, which was uh, published a few months ago. And uh, uh, we also have uh, Dr. Clay Fuller, who is uh, Dean Kirkpatrick Fellow at the American Enterprise uh, Institute, and he focuses on authoritarian survival, corruption, and the means through which uh, dictators, terrorists, and criminals use three markets to restrict uh, freedom and uh, so uh, discord. So this is our uh, panel, and <coughs> I would like to start drawing out two big points from what you said. Alan. And uh, what I think is very important, that is that uh, you undermine developing countries uh, in so many ways. Uh, when dealing with Russia and Ukraine in the 1990s, the general assumption I had and most of us had, it is that finally these people who have made so much money, they will ask for rule of law. They will want to see real legal institutions. And it turned out, as you so rightly said, not to be the case. Because there were huge incentives not to reform. Mm -hmm. The people who were there wanted to make more money. And the people who had made money and lost power, they moved abroad with the money. And uh, if you look up on Russia and Ukraine today, you know, so as you mentioned here, Russia probably has one trillion, at least 800 billion dollars abroad. This is private money. It's not the state reserves or anything. And uh, that's half uh, to uh, two thirds of GDP in Russia. So that is very safe. So you should need to do something about that money so that people want to keep it abroad. Then you will have the pressure uh, to, to reform and uh, Russia and Ukraine are as most countries in the world in this regard, unfortunately. They are not exceptions, but, mm -hmm. uh, but the rules. And the other point that uh, I think that was very uh, important you made is that this is a national security threat of global dimensions. Mm -hmm. They are buying our s states. If you take a small country like Sweden, do you know how much an election cost? $12 million. And here you have 800 billion Russian uh, money floating around. Why not buy the election in Sweden? Ridiculously cheap. And this might have been what happened in, uh, with the Brexit. Mm -hmm. Aaron Banks, with a lot of Russian uh, business connections, mm -hmm. uh, put up about uh, 10, bil uh, 10, uh, 10 million, million, sorry, I got the wrong number, the 10 million uh, dollars. And uh, that essentially bought the election. That kind of swung the, uh, the Brexit uh, uh, referendum. I, uh, uh, from a US point of view, looking up on the Mueller investigation, it's difficult to understand that, uh, why that is accepted. But uh, let me pass on the floor. Uh, Luis, you had some uh, views on the paper and the, uh, the ideas in it. So why don't I pass on uh, for you to begin with? Uh, thank you, Andrews. And Thank you for the invitation to be here. Um, 25 years ago, Anders and I used to have fights over what was going to happen, but now we've wound up in the same place. Uh, I was a little <laughs> less optimistic than Anders 25 years ago. I thought that this was going to determine the future of democracy and free markets, not only in Russia, but have a global impact. Um, 
Unfortunately, I live to see what I once said turn out to be right. But that's not the, the question. I think today we face other challenges we need to be talking about, and I think this paper is, is superb, and all of you should read it. But my first scholarly article occur, uh, was on the geography of Soviet crime. And there were certain internal policies that displaced crime, so that exiling criminals from major cities and not letting people enter big cities gave Russia a geography of crime that was totally different than other advanced industrialized countries. So I guess you could say that for 40 years, I've thought about the problem of criminal displacement. And that's the concern that I have, is that if, I mean, I certainly hope the West gets its act together in the way that you describe. But we've had ma major money laundering into Dubai, which is not necessarily the, the best investment. It's not the most liquid. It's not the strongest economies. But there are many alternatives in Asia. Singapore, which has extremely active markets and expensive real estate, Hong Kong, and other places in Asia. And we need to be thinking about this in a more global way so that if we clean up the West, it doesn't just all move to Asia that is eager to have capital investment and does not have such a tradition of rule of law and, and has a different view towards entrepreneurship and the sources of funds. So that's the first thing that I think needs more co consideration. Okay. Secondly, one of the things that's very different about Danske Bank, as far as I know, from the recent revelations of Troika Bank and the previous revelations of, of Panama Papers, is that there is a very sophisticated way of obfuscating this um, illicit transfer of funds, or questionable transfer of funds. And that is through a process that nobody talks much about, and it doesn't really figure in your paper, which is the problem of trade-based money laundering. Yeah. And this is something that looks like is actually a trade that's going on that justifies the movement of funds. Mm -hmm. And that takes a special training. Sometimes there are, is some trade going on, but, it, but you need to be pretty clever in some cases to see it, or you need to be just stupid, but you have some papers there. For example, out of Colombia, some of the trade-based money laundering to coffee, to Panama was justified in terms of coffee. Since Colombia produces its own coffee, as does Panama, that should raise the suspicions of anybody to think that there's a trade between these two countries in multi-million dollars worth of coffee. But it is a way of justifying uh, the transfers. And if you look at the Troika papers uh, of the laundromat that was released about a month ago by OCCRP, almost all of that money went through, left Russia through trade-based money laundering. And if you look at the accompanying vouchers that went with it, you have justification for equipment that was never moved or is so beyond the price that it actually cost that there was massive over-invoicing to justify this. Therefore, we're seeing the rise of cleverer and cleverer um, money launderers. And then, there's another area that I think about. And in my um, latest book called Dark Commerce, I talk about how illicit trade has transformed fundamentally with the rise of online platforms and with social media. But we need to think about how this entrepreneurship has been funded. And one of the things that we're not paying enough attention to is the venture capital funds and who is putting money into them. Many of them are not transparent. 
They're huge amounts of money, and if done well, are providing outside retu outsized returns to their investors. So not only are they making large amounts of money, they're not just depositing them in real estate, but they're getting key foothold in the new tech economy. And many of these companies are privately held in the tech economy, so they are, they are able to influence the policy and the development of the tech economy in the coming period. So this is what I think of as a dual-use harm that is not only a way of moving money, but shaping a crucial area of economic development for the West in coming decades. So there are even more compelling reasons that we need to put many more areas of offshoring capital under regulation. Thank you. Thank you, Louise. On this last point, I checked the Treasury statistics uh, recently, and the second biggest foreign investor in the United States, that is in US securities, is uh, not China. Japan is the biggest, but Cayman Islands, mm -hmm. a, a little British territory with 60,000 inhabitants and 500 banks has more than $1.7 trillion of investment in US securities. So uh, something you can always buy if you have dirty money is US treasuries. US treasuries uh, does not ask any questions and it likes all money. Uh, Clay, you have been thinking about what should be done about uh, uh, these uh, offshore companies. What's uh, your view? Just a little bit. I've been thinking about it for the past uh, year, year and a half. Um, so thank you for having me and thank you uh, for this, uh, what I think is a bold and imaginative uh, uh, report that I, I really like the ideas in there. But so I'm, I'm new to the policy world in DC, obviously. Um, I'm the Gene Kirkpatrick Fellow at the American Enterprise Institute. So I'm new and I have some big shoes to follow or to fill. Um, but uh, I should start off by saying the American Enterprise Institute- No need Enterprise to be humble. <laughs> uh, the American Enterprise Institute takes no institutional positions on anything. I just want to make that completely clear. Uh, but I am free to uh, express my own opinions. But being new to policy and talking to policymakers, I, I tend to, really like to simplify things and use metaphors for how, how, to, how to think about these large, complex, global issues. Because I do see us as entering a sort of new state of global great power competition um, that's incre increasingly becoming part of the national security threat to our economy and to our security and safety. So thinking of these offshore economies and these small, small jurisdictions, I tend to look at them as sort of the tip of an iceberg, of a larger growing underwater iceberg. And it's, it's increasingly merging with the onshore economy, as we talked about with uh, Delaware, you can think about uh, in Panama and elsewhere, and it's, it, it's mixing in. And so these offshore economies exist for a reason, because they provide some sort of benefit or they wouldn't be there in the first place. Um, and I can go into some, some uh, parts of that later, but it's sticking with the iceberg metaphor, you have the Western economies recognize there's a sort of a problem going on here. And we're trying to steer our titanic economies and power sort of around them in order to miss them or sort of deal with them in a certain way. But at the same time, if you look at it from the autocratic, <coughs> adversarial, authoritarian side of it or criminal or transnational terrorist side of it, they see these offshore economies as stepping stones to be able to hop across jurisdictions and take money, take the proceeds of, of corruption, take uh, the proceeds of criminality elsewhere, and jump into these offshore centers and then jump into the Western world and start wrecking the place and dividing our own societies, turning us into, into an enemy, which in then turns them into an enemy, which then increases the whole sort of stress and competition of uh, global political and economic uh, 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 sort of competition or, or, or struggle. So that's sort of like the big way of, of, of that I see it. And it's part of larger, larger uh, issues that are, of course, trade-based money laundering is a big uh, uh, part of it. But so if I could take a, a, a magic wand sort of, which I can't, right? So nobody by definition in a rule of law state has a magic wand that they can uh, 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 wave about policy, uh, but dictators do. 
Um, but so if I could do that, I would do two things. I would basically change our sort of idea of what transparency is. Um, so num number one, I'd change our idea of what transparency is. And number two, I would, I would bring back to US foreign policy this idea that we should prioritize cooperation and coordination with other rule of law democratic states over any type of cooperation and coordination with authoritarian states uh, around the world. I mean, that's a common sense, solid, long-standing part of US foreign policy that I think we have lost uh, uh, over the past few decades in the end of history uh, uh, period. But so dealing with transparency, right, so I think the, the sort of shading light on shady, shady deals and the investigations and scandals and fines and all this stuff is just one part of transparency. Uh, there's an objective way of defining transparency as simply credible aggregate economic data. Uh, so this, this gets into the information space too. It's about the credibility of the information. It's about the credibility of, of the data. And so when you have credible aggregate economic data, I mean, this is part of why we don't know exactly how much the offshore is worth, right? I mean, this is why it's only estimates that we have or we can only think about because there's a lack of uh, this transparency in the form of credible uh, uh, data. So if, if, if you increase transparency by increasing credible aggregate economic data, what this does is it acts as a coordination good for law enforcement, for civil society, for private, the private sector, for individual actors, in order to make better decisions about the future for their own rule of law economies and their own uh, futures, futures where they work. So if we increase this level of transparency in the form of credible aggregate uh, economic data, then we will actually be able to galvanize larger groups of people to come together to deal with this sort of issue in their own ways, in their own sectors, in their own, in their, in their, their own uh, parts of it. And so then the, the second part of that is working with, the second part of my magic wand is, is working with the EU, right? And instead of battling them on things. I mean, curr currently the EU and Treasury are battling over blacklists, over offshore uh, 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 jurisdictions because they can't decide on which ones are the bigger threat, right? Is it the US held territories or is it the EU held territories that, that, that we should, and, and so, there needs to be some consensus there because we have things in common with the EU that if we just work deeper with them and actually cooperate on this and get more credible aggregate economic data, we will actually galvanize the free peoples of the free world to take care of their own problems as they always have and all the kleptocrats and the corrupt dictators around the world will basically just collapse under their own contradictions and in internal, internal issues. Uh, and we can go about focusing upon building uh, upon the American and democratic experiment around the world in the OECD countries. Something that comes out very strongly from what you say is that this is really a threat uh, to democracy mm -hmm. and yes. rule, uh, rule of law and therefore it's a major national uh, uh, security uh, threat. And uh, what I hear coming out here very much is uh, we need transparency. And, um, In the form of credible aggregate economic data. Yeah, but, but you have uh, uh, two parts of it. One is the transparency of mm -hmm. uh, of ownership and the other is transparency yes. of the financial flow. Mm -hmm. Dealing with the Russian economy, I see that the Central Bank of Russia has wonderful statistics. Mm -hmm. the, every week you can see how uh, large the international reserves are. So we look upon all these numbers for how large is the Russian um, <coughs> uh, holdings of money abroad. It's based on the Russian Central Bank statistics that are then also shared by the IMF. We see how big the outflow is, and then mm -hmm. different assumptions are made on how much is the return on that money. The sensible uh, assumption that was done in an NBR pa uh, paper uh, two years ago <laughs> by Thomas Pickett and uh, others was zero, because the preference is to keep the money secret. And uh, so much is being done in order to keep it anonymous, but probably there's not returning. Think of uh, a house, uh, an apartment in Miami. That is the typical investment for Russian money abroad. 
and uh, you don't get much return on an empty apartment standing in Miami because empty they are most of the time. They are investments rather than pl uh, places to, to live in, in, in ma uh, m many cases. So, Luis, you deal with these matters. Do you think that anything can be done here in the US with regard to legislation? Uh, it's the House Financial Services uh, Committee that is dealing with you, and I know you're following this. Yes, yeah, so a few weeks ago, in, in mid-March, in a bipartisan effort, an effort was a piece of legislation was put forth by the House Financial Services Committee saying that we need to fix various holes in our financial system, including money laundering into real estate, um, citing a report that I was involved with, but other people in this room were involved in putting together this report, and it passed out of the House. So there is the beginning of a, a bipartisan effort to help address these holes. Now, how we address these holes and reverse the clock, that's, you know, we can set a stage going forward, but the amount of investigation it will take to get to the bottom of all of this real estate, whether it's from, it's not just from Russia and Miami, it's a lot of money from Latin America. And mm. part of this, part of why we're having also these huge migration flows to the U.S. at the moment is that these countries have also been stripped of their assets. Mm. I remember doing training about 15, 20 years ago when my Spanish was better for the Honduras Anti-Corruption Commission. So we took the plot of who owns, it was already open on the web, who owns property in Miami. And we took every name of every politician that was under investigation, and we found their property in Miami. Then we found their family's property in Miami. So this has been going on for a long time, mm -hmm. and that is having enormous consequences on these Central American countries, which are poor to begin with, and have no capital for development, no capital for education, no capital. A lot of this money came out of, her, that had been moved to Miami, was out of hurricane uh, restoration funds. So there are major issues connected to population flows. This is not just a, a, a theoretical concern of rule of law. This is people who were in Africa, have been stripped of their funds, Central America, and they get on their feet and they start moving. Mm -hmm. and, and therefore, as we begin to think about this issue, we need to be thinking also about, as you point very correctly, about how these funds are used for development, but how to make sure that they are not stolen again once they are returned, or how are they returned in development projects that actually make sense and maybe are controlled by civil society. Exactly. And how does civil society play a role in greater accountability without having members of so civil society being killed mm. for, 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 for exercising oversight over community funds? Can I say one of the things I, I, I the points I made in the report, which I think is important to this, one of the points about setting up a series of national funds and identifying the sources of those funds in terms of the corrupt assets which have been seized is that what we, and linking them to the politicians and their fellow travelers in the elites who have stolen those assets, is that simply by setting the funds up and making it all clear on the web, we are destabilizing these regimes. We are pointing out what really happened and indicating that whether it's by civil society or new democratic governments or whatever, we are providing scholarships for, for, for students from those countries to come to Western universities, whatever it may be. Uh, the assets there are ready to be used when it's possible to use them where we can use them. And I think that alone would act as a huge destabilizing effect. And it would actually, you know, it would go back to the idea of the West being the city on the shining hill, that we're here, we're here to help, we're here to make a difference, rather than the moment being a source of destruction. Helen, you are uh, active uh, both in with the European Commission and, of course, in London, where you, you live, yes. with uh, the UK. 
and we have now, uh, with regard to uh, transparency of ownership, major uh, undertakings going on. The, the fifth uh, anti-money laundering uh, directive that the European Union uh, adopted last year. Uh, how is that going? It, uh, it's supposed to uh, force all uh, uh, ownership to be, uh, all ultimate beneficiary ownership to be made public. Yeah. Uh, and how is that going? And what will happen with Britain well, uh, if a Brexit actually <laughs> goes through, which yeah. you hope not, yeah, of course not, no, no, no. <laughs> if it no, really no. goes through, and what uh, also yeah. Britain adopted a year ago, uh, legislation with, uh, uh, in this, uh, with regard to these uh, British territories that yeah. uh, disturbed people in Cayman Island, I heard. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that's true. Well, there, there are a number of different things. Uh, I, I was trying to avoid the B word. The, <laughs> word, the word that shall not be named. But, um, uh, so there is a kind of general British view at the moment is that what we hope is that uh, the thing will get revoked, we can forget the whole thing, and it's something we will never mention again. It's a terrible moment. <laughs> but anyhow, uh, let's, uh, let's read this out, my own personal crisis. Then. But I, I think on, on focusing on the issue, um, on the money laundering directive, I think the problem with it is that it's still too EU focused. And it's not, I mean, essentially the, the test I have is can, uh, under the, the EU legislation, can a British Virgin Islands company, with all the anonymized protections that it gives uh, the ultimate beneficial owners, turn up and operate in, uh, in the EU? And the answer to that is that that, that that directive does not stop that. They have to, it has to basically uh, fix also of, on foreign companies with anonymous reg regulatory regulations. That, that's one thing. On the, the UK thing, is, there's two UK things going on. One is in relation to the overseas territories, and this is causing a huge problem because the um, overseas territories, you know, the, the, the fundamental problem is that they have the 1776 problem. There is co there are colonies. Ergo, uh, they're called dependent territories these days, or overseas territories, but they're fundamentally colonies. And essentially, we can say, use the same rules that were used uh, in, in, uh, before, before the Revolutionary War, the orders in council from a Privy Council to, to regulate them if we want to, or, or acts of parliament. And so they rather don't like the fact that we are going to, we are moving in the direction of having open registers. There's a lot of pushback on that issue. So that's, the government basically has been uh, there's the huge support for it in Parliament, but the government is under being lobbied by all the dependent governments in the overseas territory. So we have a problem with that at the moment. So you don't think that it will be implemented? Well, it's the, I think there is going to be a lot of... The, the, the problem is, is as more and more scandals come out, which links into them, they're going to be on the back foot. But it, there, is, there is a bit of political trench warfare going on over that. The second issue is on the unexplained wealth orders. Now, they have started happening... Mm -hmm. And I think the National Crime Agency, which is going to the FBI, who seems to be running these, is, um, has, has done a couple so far. And there is some criticism that they haven't used lots of them. But, you know, it's a new regulation. They're, they're trying it out. And they have used it on a couple of occasions. It's certainly causing some trouble. There appears to be an exit of, uh, of rich Russians from London, which may or may not be connected to the, uh, to the development of the unexplained wealth orders. I think the other thing in the British context uh, is because, you mentioned Aaron Banks earlier, because of this issue of uh, foreign money in the Brexit referendum and subsequently, I think one of the issues which will come to the fore, whether Brexit happens or not, is a sense of which we have to protect our own political system. Because we're not rather like, rather like Swedes, the amount of money you can spend on elections in the United Kingdom is very small indeed. A parliamentary district in a general election has a maximum spend of about twenty thousand dollars. Okay, so we have incredibly low spend. So you know, it is, you know, so you, you the capacity, the maximum spend for a political party in a general election is about twenty-five million dollars. So you know, there is, so the the you know you can see the potential here for this. And they, the, so, what, so the point about Aaron Banks is, is uh, if he <coughs> it appears he can't show where he got his money from. That $10 million, in that context of those numbers, is the largest political donor in British history. And it is quite possible that all of that money came from Russia. So that is, so I think the very fact of that, and there are lots of investigations ongoing about that, that itself creates incentives to act. Now the problem with Brexit is that if, God forbid, it were to happen, particularly in its no-deal form, one of the 
the more right-wing Tory ob objectives is to create a kind of low, a kind of, if I, I call it a supersized Cayman Islands. So that would, that would, put, the Britain, uh, put, that would put, put the UK in a different direction. The only problem with that is about 95% of the population don't want to be a supersized Cayman Islands. So the, I, I, I think that would, that would be an actual problem for that to ever actually be politically delivered. But certainly parts of the Tory right would be quite happy with that. So just if as I they compare the uh, yeah. uh, US election, a full round cost about five uh, billion dollars. Mm -hmm. So there's a, a certain <laughs> difference. Clay, that was if yours. If I could inter interject mm -hmm. for, for a second. Um, uh, so two, two points. So uh, every exit is also an entrance, mm -hmm. right? And an opportunity for, for something new. Let's so leave, leave that at, at that. But getting back to the shiny city on the hill. So if you read, if you in this leading by example is sort of what if you read this piece I wrote, I wrote for this uh, uh, event. I think all that really is needed here is sort of the moral courage to just sort of take that step towards moving towards creating a more better functioning economy for the free peoples of the world. Right. That's that's all that's needed is just a little bit of moral courage to take out, get out there and 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 do that. And one of the steps is, is I think we get bogged down in the details of I'm, I'm all about asset return. I mean, but then you look at like the Kazakh example and you look at I mean, there's there's problems with that whole model. I mean, when you when you seize mm. the, the, the proceeds of corruption and then try to give it back to a corrupt government, <laughs> like there's just there's just a natural, logical, you know, uh, you can't yeah, square well, square yeah, the circle yeah. uh, uh, there. And so th I don't know how we're going to deal with that, especially with the creation of government organized, non-governmental organizations and authoritarian regimes that are set up to actually take this money back. They call them gongos. Um, to, to take these <laughs> seized assets back and then invest them, you know, in a new house and pool for their, for their family. Uh, but so we get bogged down in those details, I think, too much. And, and the whole part of it, when all that is really needed is just for Americans to come around and do the right thing, and the Europeans to come around, do the right thing with the Americans, and just take that step of moral courage to say, hey, this is a problem we're gonna deal with it. And I think the simplest way to do that is just to actually just outlaw anonymous shell companies. I mean, this is at the core of every single part of the problems that you see uh, coming out of the offshore economy, coming through trade-based money laundering, coming in election meddling, mm -hmm. coming through human trafficking and yes. in, in uh, the migrant caravans. And it, it's all that at the base of all of that is this being unable to identify a singular human owner of a legal entity that's allowed to transact in the United States, that you can form in any U.S. state with less information than and you need to get a library card. Thank you, and uh, <laughs> I think on this that we should open uh, up the floor, and not only for questions, but uh, for comments. The point you made here last, uh, and uh, see Clark uh, Gascoigne here from the Factory Coalition, that uh, the Patriot Act managed to do that for the whole banking system in the shell world, banks, essentially yes. cl cleaning out uh, the shell banks that is needed also for the other uh, uh, kinds of investment, uh, uh, part of which that, um, that Louise uh, mentioned. Please, the floor is open. Mm -hmm. Yes, please. Introduce yourself by name and institution. I think it's on with the Global Business and Economics Program here at the Atlantic Council. Thank you so much for your presentations, your papers, really terrific, extremely compelling on the what to do, the why to do it, and I just wanna ask a little bit more on how some of the reforms should be structured. Um, Dr. Riley, I liked your idea of the setting up the funds with confiscated money, and uh, you know, I'm imagining highway signs that say, in, in, instead of this road is brought to you by the Stimulus Act, it's brought to you, you know, by laundered Russian bribery. Yeah. The, the people will be driving off the road. Um, I wanted to ask you about the idea about prohibiting transactions with any anonymous shell companies, whether that could be extended to not just domestic, but all of the other offshore centers, which um, you know, it, it's absolutely right that you know we should be 
outlawing the anonymous companies here, but if we can't do it all over the world, then could you could that be a vehicle to possibly use a sort of extraterritorial sanction to clean it out entirely? No U.S. person can do business. Mm -hmm. Curious about that. And then, um, Professor Shelley, I, I wanted to ask you, I, I didn't see the House legislation, so either for, th for that particular bill or for just for your own views, how should um, beneficial ownership data be collected? At what level of government should it be administered by, by FinCEN or by the states and possibly relatedly? Should the information be made publicly available or just held confidentially by law enforcement uh, authorities? Thanks again. Thank you. Alan? Yeah, I mean, I am, um, clearly there is an issue about how you prohibit. Um, my own view about it is, is that if you have, uh, I think it's why EU US cooperation is, is valuable in this. Because if, you, if we both prohibited uh, transactions with shell companies, you can, to, to a significant degree, give it an extraterritorial effect. I mean, you can prohibit both the use of the dollar and the euro in any such traction, uh, in transactions. You can prohibit EU and US persons from using it, uh, from, from, from taking it, participate. And what you then do, participation, and then what you do is you try and seek to bring in all the rest of the OECD as well. Uh, and if you do that, you pretty much wall off uh, the c capacity to use it. I take entirely what you said, said about displacement. The point I would make about displacement is this. Whilst it's true that uh, you can take it to Asia, for example, and you could probably put stuff in Singapore and so on, and, and to a degree in China, the problem you've got is one is that Singapore is quite small so you know you can put a few billion there but putting a trillion dollars of you know, assets becomes a bit tricky I and mean, it's a scale and the problem with the rest of the world uh, and I, I'm not saying that displacement isn't an issue but the problem you've got if you're elite plunderers of the world your problem is is the, is the very the, the, the core Western value of protection of property rights rule of law and independent courts because the question is is where else can you put trillions and trillions of dollars of assets um, and be assured that you can still hold on to them do you not I mean clearly China has got a huge economy you could put a lot you could stuff a lot of assets there the question is Will the Chinese Communist Party turn around and say thank you very much <laughs> and yes. you see this is this is this is I think this is our issue. One of my feelings about this is this may well be a kind of uh, unique leverage we have based on some of our fundamental values. Now, it's not complete. There will be leakage. And, you know, the perfect there here is the enemy of the good. But I think we can actually do more on this issue than perhaps we could do on, on, on many others. There's one other point I would make is that I focused on, for the purposes, and one could go on forever. I mean, I could run a double, double size of the paper and... I have a couple of hundred footnotes, but the, um, I focus on anonymous companies. But you've also got trusts and trust structures where there is a similar problem. And I also think if we, pr if we go after anonymous companies and we go after trusts, the other it, what will happen is that you'll move into what I call a, 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 a oblique paradigm. And I, this is where I think there's a lot of displacement activity would go, go, is that what you would do is you wouldn't go anonymous, you would go oblique. So it would look like it was uh, there were beneficial owners. It would look okay, and there would be a register, and so there would be. Uh, so it would look all okay, and the, that it would it would it would create another level of problem, but of, uh, which we would have to deal with. What you were dealing with is the main issue. You're making it much more difficult, and I think then uh, whether it would be the DOJ or the SEC or the equivalent in Europe. We would have to continue pressing down on the use of oblique structures to create the same sort of uh, structures they can use for tainted capital flows as are currently used by anonymous shell companies or anonymous companies. So I think that's. Uh, I mean, there is a. There is a. You know, you, you never. You never completely get away from this displacement, as you say, is really a significant problem. But you, we have to start somewhere, and we can make it more more difficult, and then we have to keep on with it. Let me add here, you have a, an actual walling off effect uh, for most of the world today called correspondent banking. U.S. banks do not offer correspondent banking in U.S. dollars to most countries in the world. 
If I take the former Soviet Union, there are four countries that enjoy correspondent banking in US dollars. Russia, Azerbaijan, Kazakhstan, and Ukraine. Not because they are the most legally uh, adequate, but because they are the biggest. So uh, US banks are not prepared to take the compliance cost for, uh, for example, Kyrgyzstan or Turkmenistan. So they say, we don't deal with these countries. And that's why we are getting these uh, uh, chains uh, in the laundromats that uh, uh, Luis uh, talked about. So then they uh, try to go to Moldova first and uh, Latvia second or something like that to get out of a, that uh, chain. And then the Latvian banks go where? To Moscow uh, in order to get uh, correspondent banking in, in US uh, uh, dollars. So you have holes in it. But uh, it's a pretty effective uh, walling off as it is with, uh, and I would argue for many cases, too, uh, uh, too effective uh, walling off. That's why we get, get these laundromat uh, chains. Louise. So, Trashy, well, who should register ownership? Well, well let me just start with on? one point before that, where he yeah. was joking about these signs. But for those of you who are not specialists on organized crime, you may not know what has happened in, in Italy. So the Italian government, we're not talking about transnational flows, we're talking about illicit flows within Italy, have confiscated about a billion dollars of mafia assets. And then there are special laws to turn these assets back to community groups, farmers who will start collectives and do them. So you can actually see signs in Italy as you're driving around that this was confiscated from the mafia and has been returned to the citizens. You can buy jam, you can buy olive oil, all of which, which have this mark of approval that these are made with confiscated, confiscated assets that have been turned back for social good. So that, that is helping develop or show that there are consequences to illicit activity and their community benefits. And I, many years ago, I used to run tours in, on, with the Sicilian government for officials from Russia and Ukraine to look at some of the innovative ideas that had been tried on how, how to do this. So there are examples. It's not fantasy land. It's just taking this and looking at this legislation and trying to do it in better ways and, and implement it. And if you want to understand why organized crime may be thriving in other parts of Italy, is that some of this has actually been successful in Sicily. So you have the rise of the Camorra and the Indrangheta, where this hasn't been done as much. All right. On the issue of beneficial ownership, this was not uh, a specific piece of legislation that was passed by the House, but a decision that you needed to fill the gaps and the loopholes in the legislation. There are people that are much better than I at discussing the ins and outs of who should be keeping this financial information. Fact Coalition, which is in the room <laughs> and maybe we'll have um, one of the representatives talk about it, of the pros and cons of having it kept by law enforcement, kept by state. These are, are complex issues. But we need to be working towards a procedure that is acceptable, that can get through Congress and fill these loopholes. So there is a decision in principle that we need to do something, but the devil is in the details. Clark, the details are yours. So uh, <laughs> can, can we get a mic here uh, for Clark? Clark has gone from the fact coalition who's uh, doing this lobbying on uh, the, on what the legislation should look like. Uh, thanks, Anderson. How far th have you got? Th thanks, Louise. Um, yeah, so on, um, on the question of beneficial ownership and whether it should be housed at the state level or at the FinCEN level, uh, full disclosure, so my coalition is made up of a bunch of international development groups, anti-corruption groups, human rights groups um, that are concerned about you know, the, the corruption, the, the impact of the harmful impacts of corrupt financial practices, particularly through anonymous shell companies. Uh, our coalition has endorsed uh, both approaches, whether it be at the state or at the federal level. Um, the uh, politically, though, um, the federal level, um, the FinCEN approach has really come down to it's the only politically viable approach. There, after um, years of opposition from 
the state secretaries of state led by Delaware, Nevada, Wyoming to a state approach requiring the states to collect this information. Um, it seems like uh, the, the FinCEN approach, which Delaware state government actually endorsed last year, um, is is the is the most viable one. And um, while our coalition actually like would love this information to be made public, I know there's folks on the panel who uh, disagree with that. Uh, there, there are there are others um, who who would prefer that this information not be made public, and if it's done at the state level, you end up with some sunshine laws in a number of states where the information could be made public. If it's collected at FinCEN, that information is going to be made available to law enforcement um, pretty much exclusively, and to those we trust with anti money laundering responsibilities um, in the private sector, like financial institutions. Um, so it um, that seems to be where people are are coalescing. But I do have I. I have a, a question. Uh, one thing I've heard a bunch um, is around whether uh, you know the EU's moved forward on beneficial ownership. Uh, the UK is trying to force the overseas territories to do this. One thing we've heard is the overseas territories are, have complained that actually their real com competition on this issue is not um, the European Union. It's they're competing with the United States, and as long as the US doesn't move forward on beneficial ownership disclosure legislation, um, they're you know that's that's the real. Comp thing they're they're worried about um, is that something you're hearing and if so does that you know further um, the 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 importance of the US taking action um, here yeah, that's, Alan. yeah that's one of the things that I am I'm aware of is that they are uh, they use the Delaware argument to to protect themselves to some degree from this to shield shield themselves from any um, uh, argument that's the sort of thing that, that they're, they're lobbying both with the government in Whitehall and in Westminster. <clears throat> um, of course, there is, um, how can I put it, there is, uh, the, 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 of course, the very compelling argument is to say that what's the point of doing it? All you'll do is you shift the business to the states and you know, the thing will continue. So your objective will not be reached. And that does obviously play uh, quite uh, uh, well uh, in those years willing to receive it. So that does create a, a, a level of problem in pushing that forward. So clearly, if the US moves significantly, we will remove the overseas territory is one of its principal arguments. Now clearly, as you say, it's clear that still other places can be used. But if you close down most of the offshore, and when, now this is why I think the concept of the offshore is really important. It's not just the sandy beaches, it's, it's not the yeah. islands, it is, also, it is the whole west. And if you take that offshore down, then you are significantly depriving um, uh, plundering elites of alternatives. And they can't easily and readily replace the West as uh, with anywhere else, which has got the scale and the rule of law protections which they look for. So I, I really like your, your approach uh, to sort of saying, whatever it is, just do it. Um, yeah. Because that's, that's what this is all about. The recurring theme that I keep seeing is that people around the world, as they always have for the past 200 years, look to the United States for leadership. Yes. And that's what we're not showing. We've been, we've been wringing our hands and sort of thinking about this issue for over a decade and just haven't, haven't moved forward on it. And it just needs to be done. We're never going to solve all the world's problems, and we shouldn't try to, right? There's, there's always going to be thieves and corruption and criminality, and there's always going to be different holes for them to go hide in, and we're never going to clean all that up or fix it, and we shouldn't try to. I mean, we should, we should, we should try to address it, show leadership on it, and encourage the rest of the world to join us in the fight to alleviate the problems of it. The economic inequality it's, it's, it's causing at home and abroad, especially throughout uh, Africa and Latin America uh, and, and elsewhere, and uh, uh, address that as it's also becoming a national security issue, which brings me to the, there's a, the sort of three questions on whether it should be the states, the IRS, or FinCEN that holds this, this, this information here. And so that just depends on sort of how you think of the issue, right? If it's a tax issue for you, then you probably think IRS should hold it. If it's a national security issue, well, FinCEN was set up to deal with national security issues and international uh, uh, financial stuff, so it should probably uh, be with FinCEN. States don't really deal much with either of those, so I, so I, so I don't know where that, that comes in uh, uh, with it, but they obviously have a role to play as well. But everybody's sort of looking at Congress saying, do something. 
-huh. And that's all they have to do. And the rest of the world will say, they're doing something. I mean, 2018 was the year of anti-corruption in the African Union, right? Mm -hmm. And they were waiting around for us to pass beneficial ownership legislation in the United States so they could go ahead and move forward with it them themselves. But guess what? Nothing happened, another year goes by, right? And then Europe, everything. So everybody's waiting on the United States. So essentially, just do it. La can I say something? Sure, sure. Last week, uh, or I guess it was two weeks ago, I was at the OECD, which was Transparency Week and Illicit Trade Week, and I was just hearing this from the Europeans. We're just waiting for you to do this. <laughs> and for those of you who know Clay and I and Clark and others, are part of an anti-corruption advocacy network that's nonpartisan, goes across the political spectrum, and we're having significant numbers of Europeans sign up to watch how this is going so that they can be learning once we get going and, and have this as a way forward. And you're welcome to join if you're committed to working with us on this. Wh which, which I do outside of my role at the American Enterprise. And Institute. I do outside my role at George Mason. Which I do as part of my role at the Atlantic Council. <laughs> 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 Please. Mm -hmm. Dirk Mathiason. I write and blog on political and economic affairs. Uh, I am not an authority in this subject area, so I have a couple of technical questions. Um, the first one is, is that there are different forms of anonymity, and a lot of the focus is on corporate anonymity in these discussions. But how big a problem is individual anonymity, for instance, people with bank accounts in with Switzerland, you know, anonymous number accounts and so on, where they don't have to go through a corporate process and it makes it a little easier for them to be to maintain their anonymity. Um, second technical question is, is that should the U.S. pass legislation requiring uh, um, transparency and beneficial ownership of all corporations, for instance, how effective could that be if the problem is that the beneficiary information is from foreign sources? Uh, what would the verification process be so that you could be sure that that information is is accurate. There's a lot of news stories these days about poor villagers finding out that they're billionaires and they didn't know anything about it. Yeah. Yeah, I guess anybody can answer that. Well, I, I, I think the, 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 my understanding about the, the, the simple holding um, the number of Swiss bank accounts that day is pretty much gone and that um, there are a whole series of arrangements, particularly in Switzerland, with Western governments, including the United States, so you, re you really can't do that. And you, and that, that would apply to say shells. Yeah, but substantially, the the capacity there are, there are a few holdouts, but it's extremely. And of course, if you're a holdout, then you get significant restrictions on moving capital. So that the and of course, if it comes from there, then it it, it creates a red flag within the system. So the, the, and this is the point about whilst uh, you don't have to completely win in order to win in this. You don't have to actually take on every single one. If, you mo if most of the world is following those rules, most of the West is following those rules, then anybody who doesn't do it turns themselves into a kind of pariah uh, where all the transactions are red flagged and you focus on those. So that, that's one of the problems with, the, with, with, with trying to use banking anonymity as opposed to corporate anonymity. My other point about this is that is what a, the point I made earlier, that one of the difficulties is you have to think about all the different forms. And the other major form is trusts, and I think that's going to be one area which you, you would also have to apply this to. And then I think what happens is their kind of defensive position, uh, if, you're, if you're the corporate advising on this, uh, is to look at uh, create, creating oblique structures which look okay, and there are names on it, but, to some degree, uh, but which actually hide what's really going on. It's a bit like what you were talking about earlier about the trade-based money laundering. Uh, so it, the point of it about it is it becomes more difficult, and that itself will be unlawful. So therefore, uh, it's a form of, of uh, uh, illegal anonymization, which can also be challenged. So that will taint the entire process and anyone who's advising on it. So you, you, you narrow it down and make it much more risky and much more dangerous all the way through. Um, so the, the yeah so I think that's I think that's my, my, my only point on that but, but uh, the um, uh, so did you make another the verification. yeah the verification of 
So I can take that. You have a strong U.S. law that says you have to identify the beneficiary ownership of corporations in, in the United States. So that information is about foreign ownership. Hmm. What's the verification process? Yeah. Uh, so, so this this yeah. question this question of verification comes up comes up a lot, right? How do you verify that the information that's being given to FinCEN or wherever is actually actually correct, right? Because people are going to try to cheat the system. Right, so that's just you know to be expected. That's not going to be fixed anyway, and that's that's a that's a problem for law enforcement to figure out, and that's a problem for the legislators to to, to figure out how they're going to deal with it. But I would I would maintain that you know so long as I have to give up some information about myself in order to check a book out of a library, I think it's fair to ask companies to give the same information for themselves, right? So that doesn't stop me from going into the library and stealing a book or running an illicit library out of my garage or you know, selling books on Amazon or however it works, right? Same thing with driver's license, like requiring everybody to have a driver's license doesn't stop people without driver's license from, from driving. But you know, that's, a, that's a fair requirement and it's a step in the right direction. That's the leadership that, we're, that I think what we need in the West and Europe in order to come together on this issue and do something so that we can start heading in the right direction. My, my concern on this is as we're moving towards cryptocurrencies, we are facing a serious challenge of anonymity. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, I mean, some of the particular strengths of computer skills and tech skills lie in Russian and Chinese communities that are part of this illicit financial flows. So this is not a particular problem out of Central America, but it's a problem out of the countries that we're, that this report has been focusing a lot on. And, and the, the ability to follow all these cryptocurrencies and the new ones, there are now hundreds of them, is a real challenge because already now there are 4,000 um, banks, you know, bank windows or whatever that are receiving and giving out Bitcoin. And this phenomenon is expanding mm -hmm. significantly in the world. There are now billions of currency in crypto and this is expanding without this regulation and some of it is just basically being um, developed to facilitate crime and illicit financial flows. So would, you, would you mention that I think cryptocurrencies should be prohibited for that very reason because it's simply a means of money laundering and uh, the Mueller investigation showed that DRU had uh, paid with uh, bitcoins uh, their operations in the US. I think that should be a sufficient uh, uh, evidence uh, uh, to, to prohibit it, but uh, what you say, Louis, I think is very important. That this is a, a, a new area that we should uh, fight hard on. Uh, Alan, you want yeah, to? Uh, the, the other point about verification is this: there is a problem that where you've got a situation where um, effectively the, the state is wholly captured by plundering elites. One of the difficulties is that all of the documentation can be uh, generated. Uh, from state resources, so it looks like it, it is actually a legitimate state document because the, the state is actually owned mm -hmm. by the plundering elites and they can basically generate whatever documents that you need and create entire paper trails. So that is actually an issue and I understand that has been raised in one of the investigations into some of the unexplained wealth orders in London. So the, the, you can see the difficulty with that. Um, so one of the issues, I think, with this is about creating the capacity, and again, you can see at the EU and US level you could do this, is creating the capacity to be able to take out, to do the checking, so that we were able to work out whether what we've got is um, something which is a legitimate set of documents, proving property ownership uh, for, uh, for person X and being able to show source of funds. Uh, or something which is just entirely made up. Okay, the seals are perfect, the thing is on the register, uh, but actually it's the elites who control the state generating that documentation. And I think that's, that's an issue that we will have right. to face. Now, the thing about it is, is the problem with the, the advantage of going for the, you know, the big bazooka thing of freezing all the assets, 
of anonymous companies in the West. Is the, the, the difficulty is, is that you might be able to generate a few documents here and there for a few choice assets, but it will be almost impossible to do that for everything or for a substantial proportion of it. So that, 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 that also, I think, argues for taking a much a, a broad brusher approach because it effectively disables the, uh, uh, the, the thieving elite, elites of all the relevant countries from responding. Last, uh, I see two uh, questions, uh, if I can take those to, together, please. Um, I'm Steve Traver, I'm a technical consultant here in town, and, and uh, my question actually dovetails perfectly with your last sentence. Uh, we struggle continuously uh, in international negotiations with the leaders of totalitarian states, uh, <laughs> particularly Russia, China, and now North Korea, Iran, et cetera, et cetera. And one of the things that uh, we're always stymied by when we try to determine what is their hidden <coughs> agenda, what is their motivation, whether it's in North Korea or Iran or whatever. And, and we you know, have to confront the fact that the leaders we're talking to are just awash in personal wealth. And what I <coughs> found particularly amusing was your comment about investing in China. The last place they send their <laughs> money is to the People's Republic of China to try and, you know, the, there, is, there is no economy in the People's Republic of China. There's just the economy of the Chinese Communist Party. And they know where every nickel is at that comes into that country. So my question is along the lines of what do you think the implications will be if <coughs> these people actually have a much harder time hiding the money that they're, uh, we don't even, we can't even calculate how many billions of dollars mm. Putin has in the bank, uh, or for that matter, how the, <laughs> the leadership in North Korea has in the bank, mm. and you know, we're sweating BBs over trying to give them the deal that will make their country stronger, and there's a very good chance for a lot of these, they could care less about making their country stronger. Um, so what are they going to be the implications if we actually succeed in shutting down the world <coughs> as the place for them to store their money? Thank you. And last question. Hi, I'm Amy McKinnon from Foreign Policy Magazine. Um, my understanding, and please correct me if I'm wrong, is that there has been a shift in thinking about money laundering and beneficial ownership from an issue of social justice and development to viewing it more as a national security threat among policy circles in the US in recent years. Um, I'd be really interested in your thoughts on, if you, if you have also observed this shift, why that is, um, and whether the Russia investigation and the scrutiny of kind of Russian money flows in recent years has contributed to that. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so I shall say the parallel. Yeah. If you yeah, yeah, I think I think actually uh, yes. I uh, the one of the underlying points of the paper was the the concept of the paradox of the rule of law, that our rule of law is uh, and our protection of property rights is allowing these uh, elites in a whole series of developing countries to plunder their own elites in almost perpetuity and stick their assets in the West. Contrary to the position, because when you know, in earlier years our own elites had no choice but to move down a democratic path, they had no way, there was no offshore they could move their own assets to. They had to do a deal or, or face potentially revolutionary consequences. If we close down their access to the West, with there being some leakage to Asia, but frankly, there's not much where, place you can put it, then. Uh, we actually are more likely to be in a position of forcing more change in, uh, in those countries and also turning potential enemies into potential allies. So I think the overall logic of, of doing this, if you think about it from a kind of geostrategic Western policy play, you're reversing the, uh, the, uh, the, the, the you're turning what is it, a threat, which an incoming threat into an outgoing opportunity for the advancement uh, of Western democracy. I think that is one of the reasons why I think this is, this is very powerful, not, not just in terms of dealing with a national security threat, but creating a geopolitical opportunity for the West. And that's one of the reasons why this is actually much more significant than it first appears. Yeah, uh, Louis, you wanted to take the second I question. I want to talk on this historical trajectory. So 
25 years ago, Anders and I were both working on this issue, was, which was accepted neither by the human rights community or the national security <laughs> community. It was just this strange issue that we were focusing on, that we took different stances on, one on whether it was transitional, whether it was a, a, a threat to the future, but nobody was accepting it. it. Crime was just what you'd see with the mafia in Italy and not something with global financial implications. As time has developed, it's been recognized both by the human rights community and by the national security community. The human rights community has come through to it largely through the human trafficking and smuggling point of view, and the national security through the, the financial flow side. So different parts take different pieces. But in our highly polarized society, you, you can look at these issues as national security issues and get more consensus and more traction. So wildlife trafficking is also being, uh, I shouldn't say marketed, but explained as a national security issue because it brings together different communities. So it's what flies and what can we work together on today. And believe it or not, that's also happened a bit with the, the human trafficking issue in which Congress decided to um, regulate platforms for the first time with a senatorial vote of 97 to 2 because of this threat from human trafficking. So everything becomes a threat, and that helps build consensus. So I can briefly say something on both, if, if, uh, if I may. Please, please. Um, so if, if you succeed for your question on, on succeeding on these transparency issues or uh, locating, what you do is you take the high ground, and you put your enemies or your adversaries or your competitors on the defensive. Um, so there's a lot of academic research to back this up. Uh, essentially, if you look at uh, a book called Democracy, Autocracy, and Political Instability, it's the role of information, um, right? So what this does is it puts these wealthy elites in these adversarial countries on the defensive where they have to make a decision now. What do we do now, right? Which either they're going to reform or they're going to become more aggressive. But either way, America and the West stands on the high ground ready to defend itself you know, with, with the strategic uh, advantage. So I think you get, in the long run, a more peaceful, democratic, and free world that's wealthier, more prosperous, and, and happier. Um, but, you know, that's an opinion. Um, on on the, uh, the issue of transparency and national security, I'd say I'm new to policy. Um, so I wrote my dissertation on the economic foundations of authoritarian rule. I didn't expect to ever go into policy or ever come out to DC or ever meet any of these fine people out <laughs> here and make all these new friends. Um, but my key finding in my dissertation was I used this obscure uh, uh, measure of executive embezzlement and wealth and showed that from 1960 to 2010, the leading predictor of how long a dictator would stay in power was how much he embezzled while he was in office. So the more you embezzled, the longer you, sta you stayed in office. And then, and then on the other side, which is kind of like, duh, right? uh, but uh, on the other side is for the regime, for authoritarian regimes, the best predictor of how long a regime would last was the extent to which they integrated with Western liberal economics, right? So you're separating leader from regime conceptually and doing that. And that's what, that's what I found. And then I got out on the academic market and there's no jobs, right? So I'm trained as an economist. So, you know, when there's not a job market, you look elsewhere. So I started applying out uh, widely and came across this opportunity and landed in Washington, DC, probably in the exact perfect time for what I wrote on my dissertation. And it's so, it's, so it's a national security issue, I, I, would, I would argue, but I think Luis uh, explained it out pretty, pretty well, but that's where it, it's, it's, the, it's the domestic politics, international politics, and the rise of global uh, competition all, to, all together that are bringing this to the fore as the sort of 21st century <coughs> issue that we're gonna have to deal with. It's not, the, it's not the totalitarian communist ideologies of the Cold War anymore. It's about the nuts and bolts of domestic governance, of, about transparency, about corruption, about dealing with how we have better governance inside the different nations of the world. Emily, let me just add here, it's also the enormous numbers. People have only recently become yeah. aware of how enormous the numbers are. We have talked about Russia, one trillion, China, we don't know, probably two, three trillion, uh, uh, probably the biggest. Latin America, perhaps another trillion. Uh, 
uh, the Middle East, at least a trillion. Uh, so these are the four big sources. By Latin America, I mean Venezuela is probably the biggest, uh, and uh, Brazil and Argentina uh, b b beside that. So uh, th this is a lot, and it's enormous. And w what uh, Alan talked about in the beginning, how uh, uh, it's uh, eroding the, the, the whole system. So this is very much why we are doing this and we will continue doing this because we think this is very important. Uh, Luis's report. group here about anti-corruption action group, is, it's 400 people you have in it. More. Yeah, so th this is a big thing and it's also what we have all emphasized here is the bipartisan issue. This is something that can be done and should be done today. Thank you everybody. Mm -hmm.